With support from the Climate Kick Alumni Association, welcome to The Elephant. I'm Kevin Kaners. Well, last episode, we spoke to Mark Watts, who is the executive director of the C40. The C40, if you remember, is a network of some of the world's biggest cities that together are taking action to cut their greenhouse gas emissions. And you might say it's a bit of a C40 extravaganza, because today we're going to speak to the former chair of the C40, namely David Miller. David Miller was the mayor of Toronto from 2003 until 2010, and he led the C40 for the last couple of years of his tenure. While he served as mayor, David Miller made improving the sustainability of Toronto one of his key aims. For instance, he worked hard to develop a better integrated public transit plan for the city, and also worked to reduce the emissions created from garbage by creating a citywide green bin program for organic waste. And David Miller with Toronto is a perfect example of how cities can take the lead on climate change, because for most of the time that he was mayor, Canada wasn't exactly doing a lot on climate change. For the most part, it was being led by famously oil-friendly Prime Minister Stephen Harper, and Canada went so far as to withdraw from the Kyoto Protocol. But despite the challenges, Toronto went ahead and made its own target for cutting emissions. And in 2007, the City Council made the goal of reducing its emissions to 6% less than 1990 levels by 2012. And the efforts paid off, because the city ended up more than double its original goal and reduced its emissions by 15% compared to 1990 levels. Now retired from politics, David Miller now heads up the Canadian branch of the World Wildlife Fund, a leading conservation organization. Okay, and uh, just uh, to get levels, how's your day going? Uh, terrific. David was Miller was in bonjour. Paris for COP21, bonjour. and while there, I caught up with bonjour. him bonjour. to speak with him about what he in learned Paris, while being mayor of Toronto in terms of how cities can effectively lead the fight cold, on yeah. climate uh, change. kind of wish I'd brought a coat, but otherwise it was fantastic. Here's a conversation. Okay. Well, David Miller, welcome to The Elephant. Uh, pleasure to be on. I, I want to start off by asking you a bit about cities and the, the role that cities can play in fighting against climate change. You were, of course, the uh, two-term mayor of Toronto. Could you tell me, is, is this an area that you're still excited by, the, the potential for cities to greatly have a role in reducing overall emissions? Well, at COP21, uh, it's really cities that have made the biggest impact. And it's, it's very clear that if you're looking for action on climate, you look to city governments, increasingly provincial governments as well, and we should give some credit to, to where it's due. But I think for probably about a decade, cities have been showing the leadership on real action on, on climate. We're certainly seeing that at COP21. And I think probably the recognition that cities could be effective actors on climate by people other than cities, like national governments, started in Copenhagen in 2009 at COP15. Uh, with the Climate Summit for Mayors. After that moment, it's been clear to everybody that cities are really leading the charge in terms of actual concrete actions, not just policies, real actions. And, and why do you think that is? Why have we seen sort of the national and international side so kind of ham-fisted when it comes to taking action? Well, I think th there's a whole range of things. On the national government side, we have this really crazy system that requires consensus over every word, you know, in a... At the UN, you mean? Yeah, at the UN and, and the Conference of Parties um, in reaching international agreement about climate. The system requires countries literally to sign off on every word. I mean, you know, imagine if you're in a room full of 100 people and you want everybody to agree on whether you use the or a. Like, it's just impossible. It would be hard enough for the City Council of Iqaluit, I imagine. <laughs> it would be hard enough uh, anywhere. Uh, it, I mean, it really is a, a backward system. If you wanted to set up a recipe for international inaction, you'd create a system like this. And what that means, because countries can't agree within themselves, they're reluctant outside of Europe to take strong action like a, a carbon price or a cap and trade system. So that's a problem for national governments. On the flip side, you have cities who, first of all, you don't need every city in order to be effective. You don't have to wait for the recalcitrant ones. The, the leaders can lead. Um, so that's very important. Secondly, you have a, a confluence of the fact that many mayors are really conscious of environmental issues, 
partly because of their own reason to get into politics and partly because their constituents are. You know, when I was mayor of Toronto, Torontonians were very strongly in favor of strong environmental measures. They still are. Um, so you add that to the fact that cities are actually seeing the brunt of climate change. You know, the, uh, the floods in Calgary, the ice storm in Toronto, Hurricane Sandy in New York City. And so you have city governments that believe in environmental principles, want to do the right thing, but also must because the cost to cities and city governments and residents of the, the big storms and the big floods is massive. So, so on the one hand, you have national governments that have a recipe for inaction. Cities, you have all the ingredients for action, and that's resulted in some really fantastic uh, initiatives, some creativity, and some real results. Is it true there was uh, 700 mayors here in, in uh, Paris? Uh, well, there were, I don't know if the number is 700, but there, there were hundreds and hundreds. There were also other municipal leaders and the C40 alone, which is one organization, there, there were several here. It's the, the biggest cities of the world. It calculated that its members had taken 10,000 actions on climate. And if you look at those actions, they're, they're all really real things. You know, some of them aren't front page news because uh, they're not uh, sexy. But they really matter. And so my feeling of, of this conference is that the cities are where the, the action is and, and in some ways where the real leadership is. Is there anyone you met with uh, here in Paris that uh, really impressed you or any, any city initiatives that you learned of that uh, particularly impressed you? Uh, Johannesburg's very interesting. Yeah, Johannesburg has yeah, done a whole range of things, but one of them is they've built bus rapid transit to the poorest neighborhoods in the city. And the mayor talked about the importance of those projects as part of social integration, not just doing the right thing for the environment and, and you know, getting people out of cars onto transit, but when you reach out with rapid transit to low-income neighborhoods, it, it knits people into the fabric of the city. Um, and there were other South African cities that spoke about this as well from a social justice perspective. And I think those kinds of initiatives are really positive because what you're actually doing is building great cities for everybody. And you know this is a little bit of why the Transit City Plan is so important in Toronto. Um, and it's been, you know, we've started off with a bang in between 2007, 2009 and politics have slowed it down. But it really matters because those lines actually go to the lowest income neighborhoods in Toronto. So it's, it's a parallel and I think that's why it resonated with me. You know, you do what's right for the environment and if you think about it the right way, it's also good for social integration and for economic opportunities. And that's what's most exciting to me about the city actions. The best ones do all three of those things. So they create far better places to live because they're sustainable environmentally, economically, and socially. Uh, I know that you've done a focus specifically on green jobs and how combating climate change can be used as a way to uh, create jobs in, in the areas most most vulnerable. I was curious, like, would you also do you agree with what Naomi Klein says too about it being an opportunity in general to fix some of the other problems that we're currently facing in society, like inequality and um, some democratic deficits? Yeah, done correctly, environmental policy can be very democratic, inclusive, um, and economically inclusive. And I, I'm, you know, I'm giving an example, and I have to have to give a bit of background, so bear with me for a moment. According to the C40, about 75% of greenhouse gas emissions can be attributed to cities or the activities that are required to sustain cities, like generating electricity. So whether or not the plant's inside the city, you, you, you count it. So if three quarters of the greenhouse gas emissions are in cities, uh, that means that if you want to address greenhouse gas reductions, you should look at cities. Of those, the majority in most cities, 60% in Toronto, 80% in New York, are from how you heat and cool buildings. Then there's transportation and electricity generation. So if you can green your transportation, you know, by public transport, by better cycling, by building cities that are more walkable, or by uh, getting people out of uh, fossil fuel cars and into electric cars, and if you can change your electricity generation to clean, you make big advances, but the biggest advances come by ensuring that buildings are highly efficient in their use of energy to heat and cool them. So that's true in most cities in the world, it's buildings. Okay, it's not really exciting, but it's dramatically 
effective in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So what do buildings have to do with social inclusion and the economy? Well, a lot of these buildings are in low-income neighborhoods. And in Toronto, our tower renewal program, at least in, in the pilot stage while I was mayor, we thought about these things together. So we went into the neighborhoods and said to people, you know, we've got a chance to bring some investment to these buildings, you know, what would you like to see? So it became socially inclusive from that perspective. You gave people a voice about the buildings they lived in. And one of the, result, one of the responses was, well, jobs. You know, if there's gonna be investment in the building we live in, we want our children to have a chance at the jobs it's gonna create. So we spoke to the trade unions who would do the energy retrofits and say, can you train the young people who live in these buildings? And the estimate in Toronto's case is there's about a thousand concrete buildings that are capable of this particular kind of energy retrofit. Greenhouse gas reductions, if you do it, are about five or six percent. So huge of Toronto as a whole, not just from the buildings. Huge impact. And about it takes about 30 people a year to, uh, to do the work. So it's about 30,000 jobs. And most of those, if you do it right, can be young people who face barriers to employment who are getting a good chance. And to me, that's the best kind of environmental policy. It knits opportunity with inclusion with the environment. And I, it's a very specific example, but philosophically, I think it's the kind of thing that uh, Naomi Klein is speaking about. Can you tell me a bit about when you became mayor in Toronto, like, what, what sort of things did you take a look at of how we could reduce the, the emissions? And do, do we have, like, the figures of what the per capita emissions are in Toronto and, and if they've gone down? I, I don't have the figures at the tip of my tongue about what the per capita emissions are. Uh, uh, but I do know that our climate plan passed council unanimously, by the way, in uh, early 2007. And between then and 2012, emissions dropped 15% for Toronto as a geographic region, not the operations of the city, not just the operations, everything in the city of Toronto is a geographic region. So to me, that's, uh, and that's because of the plan and also because of the closure of coal-fired plants by, uh, by the province, and we, we need to give them credit. But if in five years, Toronto can do that, that means in any urban area in the world, we can make dramatic reductions. That's more than Kyoto. Kyoto required 12% at that time. So very, very significant redu reductions are possible. So how do you do that? Well, the, the gift of Toronto's plan was we did a little bit of everything. And we really embedded it in this public service. There were appropriate cross-section committees. You know, so we looked at how do you get people out of single family vehicles uh, onto bikes or onto transit or walking? Um, how do you mobilize neighborhoods? So it was a program called Live Green Toronto that gave small grants to neighborhoods that wanted to do green projects. which could be urban farming or allotment gardens or it could be community solar or all sorts of things. And we hired people to go to neighborhoods and help them create their own programs. You know, we had Transit City, we dramatically increased bus service so people would take public transit more. Um, did a lot of energy retrofits in buildings and got creative with the accounting. So that, uh, which sounds bad, doesn't it? But in this case, creative accounting was good. We created an internal fund at the city, for example, that departments would borrow from to do energy retrofits in buildings and pay it back. After they've saved money? After they saved money. So it didn't cost the public purse, ultimately, any money um, and, you know, would be paid back over time. And, and so the fund keeps replicating itself, creating more and more opportunity to do these retrofits. Plus, if you do it right, you sort of use the money twice. So if you're, you know, insulating a hockey rink, while you take it apart to put in new insulation, you can, when you put it back together, you can have a better hockey rink, for example. So we got very smart uh, uh, about the money, worked with the private sector, all sorts of things. But generally speaking, the areas I spoke about, which are how you heat and cool buildings, transportation, and how you generate electricity. And we had a special strategy for that done in partnership with Toronto Hydro. And one of the important things about that is we own Toronto Hydro. If it was privatized, there would not be the expertise in the government to possibly 
do a strategy to reduce carbon in the in the way our uh, electricity grid w was approached. It's yeah. interesting because a lot of people are talking about how important getting municipal electricity programs back into city hands uh, is for taking action. Well, I I think you know we, we've in some areas we've gone too far in privatization. You know because it was all looked at through the lens of and I'm doing air quotes here, economic efficiency, really what it was about was lowering wages um, from, you know, some would say that's efficient, some would say it's inefficient because if you're paying people properly, they spend their money in the local economy and you actually have more economic growth. And if it happens to be slightly cheaper to do coal, then they'll do coal. Yes, well, that's a huge issue, right? Because the pollution from coal's free. But I think a, a lot of those privatizations have been proven to be unwise and you really do need to keep strategic assets in the public hands so that they can be an instrument of public policy. Uh, regulation often isn't enough. And we, we see this in the electricity industry because in order to have a private plant, you have to have a power purchase agreement that lasts a long time, 25 or 30 years. So we've got these coal plants in you know Alberta, for example, where the government very commendably is trying to get out of coal. but. The, you know, they've got a, a contractual obligation to buy electricity from coal for a long time. How do you deal with that? And that is happening in part because the, the plants are out of public control. And, I, you know, yes, we have to be efficient. We have to run public services efficiently, effectively, no question. But you'd still, you do need the ability to act collectively to do the right thing. And sometimes uh, overdoing privatizations resulted in an inability to do that. I was wondering what some of the biggest challenges were in reducing Toronto's uh, emissions, because it's obviously something you care personally about. One thing that I know is, like at least in Toronto's case, it doesn't have the ability to raise out, like, outside taxes by itself. Like There was a push to get one cent of uh, provincial sales tax to yeah. Toronto. Um, was, was that an issue? Was like the ability to raise funds for the city an issue in, in doing this? Yes. It's interesting. As soon as you said the question, what's the biggest obstacle, I immediately went to financing, because cities in Canada... When I was mayor, before the land transfer tax, Toronto had about a little more than five cents out of every tax dollar that a person um, would pay in taxes or a business would pay after the land transfer tax, about six cents. So relatively, all the tax money went to Ottawa and Queen's Park. So why is that a problem? It's a problem for things like public transport because the people of Toronto don't have the direct ability to build the public transport they need uh, and want because you have to get the provincial government and often the federal government on side. You have three parties <laughs> that uh, agree. And there's moments you can do it. You know, Premier McGuinty, uh, Prime Minister Martin and I made some agreements on uh, public transit and infrastructure funding that flowed billions and billions of dollars to Toronto. But then there are moments that it just doesn't work. You know, if you get a government in Ottawa that doesn't appreciate cities or the Ottawa's fighting with Queen's Park. And really that's at the heart what the One Cent campaign was about, was about allowing enough of the money to stay in the city of Toronto under the democratic control of the people uh, of Toronto that the, the services they needed could get built, particularly the, really, the ones that require huge investment in infrastructure. Some other stuff we can be creative with, but on the big expensive infrastructure items, you have to have access to the income or sales tax in our system. The property tax isn't, doesn't even begin to remotely approach being enough money to fund that kind of infrastructure. And you were head of the C40, the, the cities on, on climate action uh, that you mentioned earlier. Is this a common problem with cities around the world that they don't have the ability to, to raise a lot of funds themselves? Oh yes. So it's what's fascinating to me is Cities have shown such leadership and sometimes have to be very creative. You know, Mayor Bloomberg, for example, in New York um, had buildings post their energy efficiency on the outside. Now, we would have gone further in Toronto. We would have taken a regulatory approach. They backed off, and I, I think we're subject to some criticism for that. But the, the posting of the numbers actually helped because the tenants all of a sudden realized, hey, we're paying to be in an inefficient commercial building. You know, why are we paying for inefficiency? Um, so, you know, that's a small example of creativity. So there's lots of stuff cities can do, but if they had access to proper funding and a supportive policy environment like a carbon tax or cap and trade, uh, there would be no stopping them. And Toronto's 15% reductions in greenhouse gas emissions over, you know, between uh, 
2007 and 2012 based on 1990 levels would just be one small example of amazing success. I was talking to uh, Mark Watts, who's the executive director of uh, C40 now, and he mentioned how on average a good European city like say Copenhagen consumes a third per capita in emissions as a, a typical North American city. Uh, so a North American city would be something like 15 tons and uh, you know Copenhagen maybe five. And he pointed out, and uh, I thought this was a very big problem, is that you know it's structural. It's how the cities have been designed. If you have a city like Phoenix or even in Toronto where there's massive suburbs like Mississauga and people are commuting in on, on gigantic highways, I mean, that's a really big problem. You can't turn on a dime there, and it's hard if you have really low-density housing in suburbs to have great transit. So I was curious on your thoughts there. How, how can that sort of thing be overcome? Yes, that's true. Um, and uh, the denser European cities often have multiple advantages. Copenhagen, for example, uh, it's, it's not as much front page news as the fact they have traffic jams of bicycles, but the fact they have district energy is hugely efficient. So what does district energy mean? Dif district energy basically means you have a plant that pipes steam heat to a whole range of buildings. So if you know if you want you just hook up as a house to the district energy network instead of hooking up to the gas and having your own uh, essentially tiny power plant which we call furnaces but they're really tiny power plants in your basement. So they have a big power plant which is much more efficient and it distributes the results of that. Um, that and we have that in downtown Toronto by the way. The Toronto, it used to be called the Toronto District Steam Heating Corporation. It's now uh, called N-Wave, but um, many buildings downtown, like U of T and City Hall, are heated by steam heat generated from one plant. It's cooling now, too, right, with Lake Ontario? It's pretty cool, eh? The, uh, and others are starting to adopt that uh, technology. I saw a couple of presentations in the C40 where they do the same thing from rivers. What we do in Lake Ontario is there's a pipeway out in the lake. The water stays a constant temperature. I think it's 34 degrees Fahrenheit. Because it's steep? because it's deep, so it doesn't get frozen in the winter, doesn't get hot in the summer. We pipe that in the summer through a heat exchanger and air condition almost all the office buildings downtown. When it was started, those office buildings would have been on hot, really hot days. The air conditioning would have been powered by coal-fired plants because they, they, they were designed, they're called peaking plants. They were designed to meet the peak electricity demands, which are on hot days. So incredibly efficient to do that. Anyway, Copenhagen has initiatives like this that, that are ultra efficient and North American cities have a long way to go to catch up. The transportation issues are real. It's very hard to retrofit um, public transport over Mississauga. You know, Mayor McCallion, who, who presided successfully over the building of Mississauga, I think towards the end of her career, realized that, you know, they'd got the transport part wrong. Still though, the biggest single source of emissions in a city like Toronto, including the suburbs, is still buildings. So there's still opportunities for significant reductions, even if it's very hard to retrofit a modern transportation grid over a place like Mississauga. And even within Toronto, we can do much better on public transit, obviously. You know, our system was a great system when the city was a million. Uh, it's now a region of six. Um, and so that's, you know, that's why it was such an important issue for me when I was mayor and why we fought so hard to get it successfully to get the funding for Transit City and why we started building it because that is probably the number one transformative thing for Toronto as a place to live and as a place to work and as a place to create jobs, let alone for environmental sustainability. I was talking to uh, climate scientist Kevin Anderson of the Tyndall Center yesterday and uh, when you talk to him, it's, it's quite scary because he's pointing out how hard it is to get to the two degree threshold to stay under it, like the num number of amount of cuts we need and without using clever things like uh, assuming that we'll be able to take carbon out of the air in the future is something like eight to 10 percent a year. And of course, we still it doesn't look like we've hit the peak yet, probably. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how how we're going to get there? It seems like there's a huge gap between how people are thinking here and the level of urgency there is in the general public and the type of actions that need to be done if we're to have a hope. Well, I think among certain national governments, there's been a lack of ambition. Like in the United States, and I certainly don't mean the president, but the Republican-controlled Congress, there's just no appetite. And it's sort of crazy. They permit, you know, mountaintops to be blown up for coal, which, okay, 
I mean, technically, you're not spending very much money to get the coal, but it's outrageous. Imagine what you're losing for future generations when you remove mountaintops. I mean, it's just because they can save a little bit. I think we need the penny to drop in some places. Um, it's dropped in Canada. Canadians get this. But, you know, if you start doing the right thing, it multiplies. So why do you want to have a clean environment in a city? Well, first of all, because it makes it a better place to live. You know, let's put carbon aside for a moment. If you've got a city that has lots of green space, that's easy to get around walking and transit, it's a great place to live. Businesses come, you know, people, people create opportunities, all sorts of things happen. It starts to become a vibrant, economically successful, socially integrated city. That also happens to be a city that's low carbon. So I, I think the key to all of this is getting some kind of agreement here in Paris and just starting to do it. And, you know, if we look at the life of coal in the U.S. and the path it comes, you can start to undo that. I mean, outside this building, there are two wind turbines. They look exactly like trees. And the leaves are vertical turbines, right? It's amazing. So the creativity that's possible with modern ingenuity and technology if we get on that path, it is unstoppable. And, and the key really is, is turning the corner and saying, okay, that's the old, the old system, we're not doing that anymore. And yes, carbon price matters. You know, yes, we need national government leadership, but it's, it's there. You know, the, the pieces are all there. And with a few more important parts, like a, a price on carbon and national government leadership, I think the path opens up. And we open up people's individual creativity, we open up business creativity, and we start building um, better places to live, and then that has a really positive kind of snowball effect. So you, you have faith that once uh, we get the needle moving, then it will accelerate? Yeah, I'm really optimistic. Um, I'm, I mean, it's knock on wood. Um, it's fairly clear there'll be an agreement here. Unfortunately, it looks like if you just had to live on that agreement, it would be inadequate. But I, I, I firmly believe once the momentum starts, it'll be unstoppable because certain things will just become not done. You won't build coal-fired plants. They just won't. You just won't. You know, if you get momentum in changing the transportation mix, uh, could be like uh, we saw with unleaded gasoline. It, you know, for a while, it was more expensive. Then all of a sudden, there wasn't leaded gasoline anymore. It was all unleaded. And I, I think we'll hit those kinds of tipping points in a variety of things. And, you, you know, you add the kind of uh, fund we had that departments could borrow from and pay back out of energy savings to, to create sustainable programs of energy savings in buildings with ideas like posting energy consumption on commercial buildings, you know, with other innovations, and they'll multiply really quickly. And the, the key point is, many of these ideas are actually being done somewhere in the world. It's not like we have to invent things. We just have to pull them together at scale. And that's what's, that's what's been missing because the national governments can't agree. And if they agree here, then we're capable of pulling them together at scale. So I'm not a pessimist. I'm curious to hear about, uh, you head up WWF Canada now. What is, what is your work like there? What is your, what is your main focus on lately? Well, what we're working on in WWF Canada are the areas of nature or uh, biosystems where there's the biggest impact of people. And our, you know, our view at WWF Canada is we can make lasting and sustaining gains in protecting our natural environment if we include people in the process and recognize their needs as well. Um, so we're working strongly as an example in the cod fishery off Newfoundland. You know, two generations ago now, we fished out the cod. It's the most extraordinary thing. When Europeans first came to Canada, they wrote in their journals that they could get off their boats and walk to shore across the backs of the fish because there were so many of them. And then by 1992, we couldn't fish anymore. We had to close the fishery because of overfishing techniques that weren't environmentally sustainable. We didn't respect nature. Which is scary when you think about it because the parallel to the climate could be made where we didn't see what was coming until it was too late. I, uh, there are a lot of troubling parallels and it's not, you know, we've done this multiple times as humans. You know, whale oil, right? 
all sorts of things where we just we use nature until it's not there anymore and that's the thing about the climate issue you know our elders in a sense um, uh, to use a more indigenous term the scientists have said this is coming right we need to listen to them just like we didn't listen when the cod fishery collapsed the good news is for us the cod's starting to come back a little bit and we're working with uh, the fish harvesters, uh, with the government, uh, with retailers, with wholesalers, fish processors, everybody, to have it be brought back on principles of sustainability. And we're working in local communities in Newfoundland to do that. And that's, that's the way we want to work at WWF Canada, is you know, we'll help uh, ensure sustainability by including people and recognizing that, you know, people need a social and economic existence too and how do you ensure that that's all conducted in a way that that protects nature it's one of the reasons for example that we fought so hard against the northern gateway pipeline and i'm you know i'm delighted that uh, the trudeau government has banned tanker traffic off bc because it means there won't be a pipeline well it was going through an area where there'd been an agreement between First Nations and environmental groups and the provincial government and the loggers and the miners and everybody had figured out how to live in relative harmony of nature in this ecosystem that's based around fresh water and the salmon. And that's pretty fragile. You know, uh, dumping an entire tanker of diluted bitumen should the worst happen would have irreparable consequences for, you know, two decades. Uh, so it's the wrong place for a pipeline and, and there was a written agreement called the Great Bear Agreement that showed how you could create sustainable livelihoods based in harmony with nature. That's the kind of work we're doing, and we're, we're doing that off the coast of BC. We're doing it in the Arctic, St. Lawrence, Bay of Fundy, uh, Grand Banks of Newfoundland. The, most, the places in Canada where there's the most significant risks from people's activities, and we're trying to build, build models that include people and protect nature. Um, and I, I'm enjoying that because it's really exciting work. You know, people are open to this and they want to work with us. And I, I think we can achieve some real results. Do you think we need a philosophical change to if we're going to actually solve the climate crisis or not? Do you things like uh, completely damage fish stocks until they're, they're over? Like, do, do you think do you think there's something wrong with the, the general way we we viewed ourselves as, as humans? Well, I, I think it is a, a change of philosophy. And, you know, we can... T- we could all sit down a bit and, and learn a little bit from indigenous people. You know, one of the things I did in Paris was go to the Equator Prize, which was our prizes and awards given to indigenous people from around the world for their work on sustainability, including sustainable livelihoods. And there's something really powerful about not just thinking about the next financial results for the next quarter about thinking <clears throat> what we mean to the next generation, or in many cases with many indigenous people, seven generations. And I, I, that's one of the problems with you know the economic system we live under. It's driven by quarterly results. So, Which is even worse than the election system with every four years. Well, it sure is. And you know, good politicians will be in it for the long run and will think that way. But yes, of course, the cycle does drive you to think about four-year terms. But the you know quarterly results might make sense on a quarterly result to explode a mountaintop to get really cheap coal so you can burn it for three months if you're thinking about it from a generation or seven generations it makes no sense at all and we need to incorporate that longer run thinking in how we analyze these problems and that's the kind of solution we're trying to bring as best we can now we're a catalyst you know we bring people together um, we bring organizations together, we bring business together with people and organizations. But I, I think more and more people are starting to be open to these kinds of ideas because they've seen the result of really short-term financial-based thinking. And in so many areas, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Do you miss uh, being mayor at all? Or do you miss being uh, directly involved with politics? Because it seems like so much of the actions, uh, the easy actions or the obvious things are in the political realm. Well, I've been talking about cities here, partly because that's the, the questions you've asked, and obviously I'm, all, I'm very passionate about cities, but I actually think many of the results are within our capacity as people. And government needs to take some actions 
But if we put everything on government, we're abdicating our own responsibilities and we're also burdening them too much. So certainly at uh, WWF Canada, what we try to do is help create a, a way of moving forward that we can move forward even if the government's not on site, which you sort of had to do over the last uh, nine or ten years because it was rare for them to cooperate on environmental issues at a national level. But maybe you can move faster if you have the government at your side. Um, and I, I, that's the, the way I look at it. I'm a, in terms of my personal basis, I was involved in electoral politics for 20 years. People didn't always see that because I was mayor for seven. 20 years is a very long time to be involved in politics. And, you know, I, I would have liked to add one more year um, because there were some things that uh, I had started and, and council had started under my leadership that would have not been disrupted had there been one more year like some of the transit projects but they're coming now i felt i made my contribution i, I loved every second of it. it was a privilege people really wanted toronto to succeed when i was in office and they they put their uh, faith in that in city council and my administration and people were incredibly supportive in helping the city succeed um, that was a very special moment and do i miss that feeling yes do I want to still be running for office? Uh, no, I, I made my contribution. I did my best and I'm um, very happy doing what I'm doing now. And, and who would know that uh, the office of the mayor of Toronto would unfortunately become such a world famous thing? That wasn't exactly what I planned, no. <laughs> well, to end off, you mentioned uh, the role that individuals can play in making the transition happen. So I'd be curious as someone who has you know, been within power structures himself, do you have any thoughts on, on how that pressure can be created from the outside uh, to get us to, to move, either at the city level or the national level, even if the governments of the day don't tend to agree? Well, I think, first of all, we have to look at our own actions. You know, it's not just like about... Personal reductions? Yes, it's not just about lobbying. And, uh, you know, I think the environmental movement sometimes gets it wrong because we've made climate change into such a serious thing, which it is, but, you know, it's so daunting that it's almost like people throw their hands up you know what can I do and I think the other thing we've done a bit wrong is it's always we want of governments I think we need to say to governments we're here we can help you achieve your goals um, and here's some ways and you know let's start with people you know is your own apartment or house insulated properly you know that can save energy um, what about your own transportation methods you know, do you take public transit? If you don't take it, do you use low emission sources? You know, if you have to drive all the time for, for work, is there any way you could choose one day a week not to? You know, are, there are numerous choices we can make in our own lives that actually, if added up, make a very real difference. And if you li live in Canada, we're both from Canada, and, you know, under the, the Harper government the past 10 years, if they're going to go full ahead steam with the, the Alberta tar sands and all those individual actions don't seem like they count for much. Well, I think they do because they create a sensibility that together we're acting and it makes it much harder for a government to contradict that by you know building pipelines, so many pipelines that it means that the production of uh, the bitumen deposits in Alberta, the mining, will double, which was the original plan. It's not happening now, fortunately, because the price dropped. Um, sure, I mean, there's an important role for government actions, but we have to take responsibility too. You know, for example, our house is bullfrog powered. So I know that the energy we use is clean. I maybe pay a little more. Well, actually, Jill pays a little more. <laughs> she pays that bill, but it's the right thing. Um, and there's all sorts of things you think about. Where do your clothes come from? You know, do you make them in Canada? Are they made in Canada or are they shipped from thousands of miles? Um, you know, what's the greenhouse gas emission impact of that? Uh, you know, and when you can buy apples from Ontario in, you know, the early fall, are you buying them from just up the street or are you buying them from Mexico? I mean, there are many, 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 many things in our own lives. Do we need government action as well? Absolutely. How do we get the government to act? Well, I think, first of all, Canadians are environmentalists. There's no doubt about that. And you know, why do we end up with an NDP government in Alberta? Because people in Alberta recognized that the government had gone too far. And although they make, many of them make their living off the oil industry, 
they want to do the right thing too. So um, yes, we need government action, of course we do. But uh, I don't think we should be in a position where we just say it's all about government action because then we're letting ourselves down and we're also not creating the necessary momentum in order to, to you know, make change. Well, let's uh, certainly hope some momentum is building here in Paris and, and beyond. David Miller, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. That was my conversation with David Miller, the former mayor of Toronto and current head of WWF Canada. And that's it for The Elephant this time. The Elephant is made with support from the Climate Kick, that's KIC Alumni Association. It's a community of entrepreneurs and young professionals working on creating a climate resilient society. Find out more at ckaa.eu. And The Elephant is online. You can find us at elephantpodcast.org, and there we have all of our episodes. Or to keep up to date, you can like our page on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at elephantpodcast. And feel free to drop me a message over email. You can get me at kevin at elephantpodcast.org. I'm Kevin Kaners. See you soon.